exactly how we come to say, I want to talk about this. I mean, if I were to say the same to you, next year I want you to come uh, and give a workshop. But first you're saying, well, what do I know that people don't already know? It just seems like everything I say, everybody said it a thousand times before. And so I, you, I run the risk, and we all run the risk. Of course, everything we do is autobiographical. Right? You know that. Um, but I always run the risk in this uh, of turning into sort of a solipsistic exercise because I keep thinking, well, what have I learned? What was the prayer yesterday? Um, what is God telling you right now? And so I guess I was thinking along those lines when this idea came to me um, of silent activism. Let, let me start with a, a classic text in Christian ethics uh, by Paul Ramsey I read many, many years ago. Uh, Ramsey basically is what we call a, a, a duty-based Christian ethicist. Uh, and so his logic is, the Christian ethic is, you must drop everything you're doing and forget yourself completely as soon as you encounter the next person, especially if that person has a vision. Strong duty. But what really captured me in the text, and the thing I never forgot, is he said, you never know until you have reached a point of utter desolation dryness, darkness, and hostility, if you're in love or not. That's a grab. In other words, for all of our poetic proclamations, and God knows I did a few in my younger days, I want to burn the poems I, I wrote for my wife 28 years ago. I hope to God they get rid of them before I, I perish. But... Uh, for all those prophetic proclamations, uh, I never knew I was in love until it got really hard. Until there was nothing coming in anymore. And that's Ramsey's point. It, it reminds me of Aristotle's taxonomy on friendship. Aristotle said, most friendships are pleasure-based. You make me feel so good. <laughs> I'm in love. <laughs> or utilitarian. Some material or psychological benefit we get from the other person. But true friendships, where the good of the other must supersede yours in all things, are very rare. But then again, isn't that what Christ told us? You really love your life? You have to lose everything for love. You have to lose your life, however you understand it, to be in love. And if you really want to be a disciple, you must, we all know the words, deny your very self. So it seems to me, from this vantage point, that love is continued giving and forgiving and bearing the daily cross, the silence, humility, and trust. Now, I've been an activist for a long time. And after over a half century of being in struggle, I guess I could call it that, um, what comes to me is the authenticity of my activism. Just like the authenticity of my love has to be selfless. To the degree I am selfless, I am in love. Is that true? To the degree that I am selfless, I am in love.
that's not to say that there's no point or no meaning to go out on a limb publicly, uh, to swim against the moral and political tide, as is apropos of the prophet. But then again, remembering the letter to the Hebrews, few of us have done so to the point of shedding blood. And I'm reminded, as I look back over my activist career, how easy it is to fall into the trap of which René Girard speaks when he says that in casting out the evil and calling out the, the, the demons and calling out those who, who mal maliciously mal malign human life, I run the risk, of, as greater risk of Satan casting out Satan than of Christ casting out demons. So it seems to me, again, from my vent, authentic activism begins when the lights go out, when the press conference is over, when we put the signs away after the demonstration. And we're all alone. And we are in a desert of silence. Now, I don't want to seem like a naysayer to people who I'm sure are less narcissistic than I am. But I can't resist talking about all the good work I do for the kingdom of God. <laughs> And I say to myself, is the work any less valuable if anybody knows I do? do I, would I get the same motivation to sacrifice for justice for the world if there was no repayment, if there was no flattery? If there was no affirmation for the things that I do. And I have to say that at least in my case, the jury is still out as to whether anything I do is not about me. How much do we want to be heroes? Heroes are trumpeted everywhere these days. I go to the hospital. Heroes work here. <laughs> I walk past the senior center. Heroes work here. I had to go to the 50th precinct the other day. Heroes work there too. <laughs> you may remember the book written years ago by Ernest Becker called The Denial of Death. And Becker, who was a deep admirer of Kierkegaard, said the heroic impulse, unless refined, is all about raising ourselves above the inevitable humdrum march towards oblivion and death. There's something in us that wants to say that we're, we're bigger than that we're beyond uh, the mundane, the humdrum, and the boring. Following Kierkegaard, Becker says, we're all depressed. Just, just start there. We live in bodies that are bound to be sick and decay, and yet our imaginations remain in And he says, you're depressed. <laughs> There's only two kinds of depression, though. There's the, there's the chronic depressed who look at life and look at its fragility and have a hard time raising themselves above uh, that malaise. But he says that the heroic depression is to somehow deny it all. Keep that calendar busy. Keep active. Keep doing it. And somehow within that 
is this fanciful illusion that I'm not on that same march. Read what he says about uh, conflicts in children. You parents know it as sibling rivalry. He says, it's not that children are vicious, selfish, or domineering. It's that they so openly express our tragic destiny. We must desperately justify ourselves as objects of primary value in the universe. We must stand out, be heroes, make the biggest possible contribution to world life, show that we count more than others. He's got a marvelous image. He says, we love to assemble character models. I should have come in one of those medieval suits, <laughs> clanking with, with my spear, because I'm a character, I'm a collector. I got all my awards on the wall. You know, I got all my little things that I put in my, uh, my of course, my CV. Oh, I fattened that CV up. I can't wait to add something new into it or my resume little gold stars, my 90 seconds of fame. Oh, I cherish that. That's my armor. So the question becomes to me, what should activism look like then? If I should do everything I can to decenter myself. But we already know the answer because we're people of faith. And scripture abounds with silent activists. We know that. We start with Isaiah, right? I mean, how, how silent and, and, and active is this phrase from the suffering servant? He will not cry out. He will not lift up his voice. He will not make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench until he has established justice in the earth. That's what I mean. I mean silent activism. Seeking the shadows, shedding all light on the one in whom we move, live, and have our being. Silent activist is incarnated, of course, in John the Baptist. You know, you read the first chapter of John, the humility of this person. Twice he says, I did not know. He's baptizing people. He said, I, I didn't know. The implication being that without a life of silence, a life of solitude, a life of asceticism, self denial, intimate prayer, he might never have seen. But then he writes, I'm not the Messiah, only a friend of the bridegroom. And I rejoice to hear his voice. For this reason, my joy has been fulfilled. He must increase, and I must decrease. Now we know the silent activism is <laughs> so. What does Christ tell us in Luke 17? When you have done all I commanded you, you can, you can fill it out for me, can't you? Say, I am an unworthy servant. I have only done what was my duty. So clearly, guys, I'm trying to say, and I know this, this is a confession here, clearly being on the right side of issues uh, is not enough. Of 
course, we all know Thomas Merton in, in Faith and Violence. He writes about the tyranny of results. I'm hurt by what's going on in the world. And I'm numb about what's going on. I'm paralyzed. I can't, I can't raise up my spirit by saying, oh, well, you do this or you do that. And I often wonder to myself, where does that listlessness come from? Where, where does that torpor? And is it not? Well, what difference would it make? Who's going to know about it? Who will recognize it? And I realize I have a fear of being anonymous. I want to be known. I want to be heard. A friend of mine just died last year. God rest his soul. He was a silent activist. He was just getting his PhD when I, you know, was beginning to think about getting one. He got his from the University of Chicago in anthropology. And wait till you hear his committee. Victor Turner, Paul Ricoeur, and Mary Douglas. I'm saying to myself, brother, you got your ticket written, bro. <laughs> he went into the seminary to be a priest and went and spent 35 years in rural El Salvador. Died there, buried there. While he was in El Salvador, doing all this anonymous good work, he wrote a book published by, I think it was Orbis, uh, but he wrote it under a pseudonym. He had to, because it was a blistering condemnation of the oppression of the poor. And as you know, going back even into the 80s, death squads. You could be killed for reading the Bible. Kids had to go play soccer and they would put the Bibles inside their, 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 their bag for their book, their, their, their ball bag, and they could go in the back of the field and have a, a Bible study because they because this idea of reflecting upon their situation politically and right of was so compelling. And it was a death sentence for many of them. Anyway, the narcissist here <laughs> is thinking, why would you write a book anonymously, brother? Why would you do that? No book signing, no interviews, nothing to show the promotion and tenure committee. <laughs> but that in and of inspired me and continues to inspire me. Who wrote the book of Hebrews? Who wrote Titus? Who wrote Timothy? There's some question now even whether, whether Paul wrote Ephesians. I, Paul, a prisoner for Jesus Christ. They were content to bury themselves. to bury themselves, to magnify God, and to magnify the great apostle. That's silent activism. I think of maybe one of my favorite mystics, maybe one of yours, Pseudo Dionysius, another anonymous one, named after Dionysius the Areopagite in the Acts of the Apostles. Listen. Listen to him. 
Trinity, higher than any being, any divinity, any goodness. Guide us in the wisdom of heaven. Lead us up beyond unknowing and light, up to the farthest, highest peak of mysticism, where mysteries of God's word lie simple, absolute, and unchangeable in the brilliant darkness of a hidden silence. Amid the deepest shadow, they pour overwhelming light on what is most manifest. Fill our sightless minds with treasures beyond all beauty. For this I pray, and my advice to you, leave behind you everything. Perceived, understood, everything perceptible and understandable. All that is not, all, all that is not, and all that is. And with your understanding laid aside, strive upward as much as you can toward union with the one who is beyond all being. Well, that's perfect mysticism, I'd say. And it's perfect activism. And the connection between mysticism and activism, right, prophecy and prayer, is an indelible one. It seems to me hollow and ineffectual to be a person of prayer without a burning sense of commitment and compassion for the world. Thomas Merton again says, when you pray, you enter into the heart of Christ. And when you enter into the heart of Christ, you enter into the heart of suffering and end. It's impossible to be a mystic and not be an activist. But oh God, the tendency to be an activist without being a mystic. And then you have a whole other set of problems, it seems to me, starting, of course, with the tyranny of the ego. I think St. Paul was a silent activist in his own way. I love the statement, humbly see others. Always see others as better than yourself. And of course, Christ, our exemplar in all things. Not just a perfect union of prayer and action, but also those things that I always found curious before I learned to love God. Every time he did a healing, what's he going to say to people? Tell no one. I could never understand. Why? You gotta tell people. What good is it if I don't know? Well, I see a little bit better now. So what does a silent activist do? Couple ideas, right? You, I, you all wanna know, right? What does a silent activist do? Silent activist, it seems to me, has to be ruthlessly, uncompromisingly aware of the false self. Because the false Andrew Scott Nicky loves no one. Neither God nor him. The false Andrew Scott Nicky does everything for praise and nothing for authentic service. And the false Andrew Scott Nicky wallows in self-indulgence. And so to keep my eye continually on this false self, I, I think you remember, David, I'm, I'm so enamored of Camus and uh, his idea of the secular saint in, uh, in the plague. And his, his spirituality, which inspires me, was completely negative. He says, it's all I have to do every day to guard every breath so that I don't breathe the plague of violence on anyone. That's all I can do. It takes everything out of me just not to breathe hatred, hostility, judgment on anyone. It seems to me the cons that the, uh, the silent activist must be aware of what we call biopolitics. 
I bear in my body a system of materialism, consumerism, relentless judgment, comparison. I bear it in my body. I bear it in what I eat, what I wear, how I travel, how I invest, how I entertain myself. My very image of my worth is a human being. And I can carry out a revolution no one ever has to know. A deep down gut revolution every day by remembering the wise words of a sixth century Syrian hermit named Philaxenos who said, the richest person in the world possessions, but the one with the fewest needs. Yeah, I, can, I can be a silent activist. I can resist neoliberalism. I can resist the urge to buy and to judge others by how they look and what they wear and what they do. A silent activist organizes collaboratively, shines the light it's very hard for me. And when she, when she runs into conflict, we talked about it earlier, like when you said about the uh, slapping on the cheek. I remember the words of Isaac of Syria whenever we run into the inevitable conflicts. If you are truly merciful, do not grieve inwardly over such things. Do not tell others of your loss. Let the loss you suffer from your offender be swamped in your mercy. Show fullness of your mercy by the good with which you repay those who have offended. A silent activist keeps commitments. Stanley Hollowa said once, you want to do something revolutionary? Keep a commitment and stand by it for life. You will be a rare person in this world of shifting allegiances, temporary unions, ca casual encounters. Spiritual director I loved dearly, my favorite one, once said to me, Andrew, 90% of prayer is showing up. It's dry. It's boring. There's no emotional attachment. There are easy distractions. There are a hundred different things that seem you could, be, you could be doing that would be better. Just keep doing it. 90% of activism is showing up. Just keep showing up. And those momentary victories, be assured, as St. Paul says, you are reaping a harvest you did not sow. And be content with the fact you're sowing a harvest you will not reap. And finally, the silent activist remembers the wise words of Richard Rohr. And that is how you do anything is how you do everything. What kind of activist am I? Check me out in an overly long, tedious checkout line at the supermarket. You'll find out what kind of, t what kind of an activist I am. Oh, I don't yell. It's the... <sighs> That's what kind of activist I am. Check me out on the highway. Check me out when, when I'm walking down the street, going to class, uh, uh, dealing in department meetings. The tedium of life. How do you handle that, Mr. Because how you handle that is exactly the, the level of commitment, honesty, and integrity with which you confront the injustices. I 
close with those words we've all heard from Malcolm X, but I, I think this is a silent activist, a would-be silent activist. Very wonderful lyrics, and whatever I do that's of any good or of any value, all glory must go to God. Only the mistakes of the well. Well, that gives us a little time, guys. I didn't keep you too long, 35 minutes. And so we will welcome uh, any comments uh, from uh, anyone who's listening or uh, we have a microphone. I'd love to hear any comments you might have or questions. Please. Use the mic. Oh. Hi, everybody. My name is Diane. Can you hear me? OK. OK. Um, thank you. So I'm thinking of Larry Itliong, Dolores Huerta, Tim Cornge, Christina Cabrera, Aki Soriano, Yuri Kochiyama, Grace Lee Boggs. I'm thinking of people who don't do activism as an issue, but for survival. There is, um, I think, a fundamental difference between choosing to come alongside people and having to be an activist for your own people. There's a fundamental difference with being able to put something on a CV and people who don't have a CV. Um, I'm thinking of garment workers, sweatshop workers, farm workers, gang interventionists, HIV AIDS outreach workers. Um, I'm thinking about the people that have to protect inmates who are making our clothes for 19 cents. Um, I'm thinking about people who will never get a press conference, a book, a title, and a workshop. And I think there are more um, people who live into that because they need to put food on the table, they need to um, make sure they're not deported back to a country that we bombed. Um, so I just wanted to bring light to those unnamed people who never seek, who never seek attention. And those are the, the pioneers that, that really schooled me to, um, to love in ways that, that Christ loves. Because um, not only did Christ come along the marginal, Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, and, 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 I, and I'm glad you said that, because right? I was saying, you, you, I, I'm in the jails all the time. I, I, don't, <laughs> I, don't, I don't preach this to, to people who are in prison. I preach it to those of us who know of the problems of the world and seek to be honest, both with our frailty and our fear and our fragile self-images, and the compelling call of the gospel. So thank you, Diane, absolutely. And of course, there are prophets. Uh, and they don't have to be, um, as you say, they don't have to write books to be prophets. They simply raise their voices in sorrow. But again, what, what do we do? What, what do we do as the privileged ones who can stand aloof from all of that? Space, the lightness of my skin, straight of my hair, which neighborhoods I'm in, which zip codes I'm in, who's looking at me what, in some type of way. So in some spaces, I have privilege. And in other spaces, I'm getting a whooping. You know? So I think that having discernment and knowing how to navigate an array of conditions is also crucial. And being humble and, of course, listening to Christ is crucial. Um, but sometimes you don't have the luxury This is a very good space to be able to do that. My people have been deported back to Cambodia, Vietnam, my people have been slammed in the street for being Asian. So uh, my people have been prosecuted for life. They're not seeking any kind of recognition. They just want to be able to stay home. Mm -hmm. Diane, thank you.
That's a beautiful. Thank you. Thoughts, questions, guys? Any questions from uh, our viewers? Okay. Was the anthropologist you mentioned David Blanchard? Yes. How did you know him? I knew David Blanchard. I think he, uh, I lived with him when he was writing some of those oh books in, in El Salvador. Oh my God. Yeah. So you knew him. Well, he yeah. died last year, did yeah, you? Yeah, know? I did. I didn't know that. But he, I, I lived with him. I was doing an, an internship there. And uh, we were four men living in this. We had the, like, the palace on the street because it was two rooms. We had two oh. rooms. And so he and this other guy lived in one room. And then I lived in what would have been our common room. And I slept yeah. in our common room. Yeah. And then there was another guy. Uh, who, uh, like, my bed went this way, his bed went this way, and then uh, there was a table there. And David didn't wear a watch, ever. <laughs> ever. And so he would shout over to me, uh, Michael, what time is it? It's 5 a.m. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and then he would come out, and he would sit at that table with this laptop but not like this is 92 so the little laptops were he would turn on the light and and he would start typing and that was that was the start of that book. he was a brilliant man yeah it was funny because he he encouraged me to go to graduate school yeah and i kept thinking oh i want to be like him and then he went he went and lived in el salvador I said i don't want to do that <laughs> i would go whenever i was in el salvador i would go see him oh god real bless you real right mentor for me so thank you yeah but he he gave away a, a well, he didn't give anything away. He found the most beautiful thing he could have done, you know, giving his life quietly and selfishly uh, to marginalized people. But thank you. All right, guys. You good? Yes, yeah, sir. Hi. <clears throat> um what you were talking about, you know, resumes and doing things from pride and stuff is just familiar to me in a certain way. And I had this, this feeling, this idea of, of harnessing hypocrisy in a way, like, uh, to get stuff done and to go ahead and be like, to go ahead and self promote sometimes, um, for a good purpose. And then I feel like, uh, it didn't work it like my plans like got thwarted. So then all I'm left with is like the pride part and not a harvest that justifies it. But anyway, I still just want to say, I kind of want to stick up for myself on that and say that it, it's not a bad idea. It, it could work, but I just wanted to share that. That's beautiful. <laughs> and you know, I, I, again, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm a little melodramatic, but as I say, I can only talk out of my limited experience. Um, you know, God uses everything. That I do know. And I got a call today from a woman I worked with in Chicago. I left there in 1987. And uh, I was doing community organizing and working at the Cook County Jail. And um, I look back on those years as I try to put everything under the cloud of forgetting. <laughs> yes, if you know the cloud of unknowing, you know, I feel like I've confessed to, it would seem to me just a lot of uh, uh, ego tripping and having fun and you know pounding on tables and getting arrested. But as I say, really enjoying seeing my picture in the newspaper uh, and having that sort of notoriety uh, of being an activist. Uh, what I'm trying to say is, is that for all I look back on that, is just a large uh, exercise in ego. Um, this woman called and told me, thank you for all this incredible work you did. And you really moved me and I have cancer and I never had a chance. You know? So I know, uh, I, I have a tendency for hyperbole, you know, but uh, that God uses everything that we do, even our flagging efforts for justice. So I just felt I had to say something um, as I get a lot more humble 
in my senior years uh, that I, I feel like I want to do it now just because it has to be done and nobody has to know about it. We good, guys? Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all.